is something that everyone is going to understand and invest in because it's the only technology that can solve big problems. I was super thrilled when I saw that. That was a few months ago. Because biotech is now moving into the popular culture. It's not staying on the fringes anymore. It's no longer those, those people doing cancer drugs or, or esoteric things in the corner. No, it's affecting everyone's lives in new ways. The second thing is about independent biology and destiny. So, what do I mean by independent biology? I mean Dindy Bio Dindy Bio because it stands for independent biology, a path for amazing scientists to be able to go and build world-changing companies and to create a new path for themselves. And myself, Alex, June, Pope, and the whole team flies around the world every year giving talks and classes on how to build biotech companies. And afterwards, I'm always amazed by the number of scientists that come and mob us to talk about the ideas they have around huge world problems and how they want to solve it, and more than the equity that they're trying to keep by going in a more low-cost way of doing things, is the destiny in shaping their future that they care about, and the ability to translate their technologies in a way that matters to them. And third, the number 105, and futures. So we funded now 105 companies since IndieBio started, which is a remarkable number. We've also created 105 different possible futures. And that's a really amazing thing to me when I think about all of the companies you're going to see today, all 11, and all the companies in our portfolio prior, are all trying to do something so large that if any one of them succeeds, it will create a new future. And collectively, those companies have now a net complete value of $1.2 billion, just crossing that number. So they're creating real value in the world, and that is remarkable to me. And uh, these are these are companies that you'll see in just a short amount of time started just four months ago, six months ago in some, in some cases, and they go on to do very remarkable things in a very short amount of time. I'd like Alex to share a little bit more concretely how some of these companies are doing. I want to take a few minutes to talk about our alumni, and one of the big reasons is the companies you'll see here are four months old, and watching the alumni and their course and their speed gives a really good idea of you know, what you can expect from these companies in the coming years. So first off, with some of our more product-focused companies, um, I want to mention in the last three months we've actually had our first two Series B companies um, raised. The first one is from our very first batch, they're called Terra Foods. And uh, they raised from Gridion and are now using that money to scale and actually bring an entire portfolio of proteins to the market, um, both for industrial and soup to be consumer uses. And the other company that raised a B is called Notco, and they are from our fifth batch, actually. A company that started off um, with three co-founders, now has over 100 people on their team. They've launched in four countries with three different products. We're actually the very first company um, that the Bezos Family Fund invested in in Latin America. Uh, alongside them, uh, from batch one, uh, Endless West launched their molecular whiskey, which they make without any barreling or aging, and actually sold out their entire first product line in a number of months, uh, going from concept to actual market launch in uh, a little over a year. Uh, from batch two, there's uh, Geltor, um, and they're making collagen protein without the animal, and actually launched uh, the first ever on the market real human collagen, which is in cosmetics and is selling out um, all across Asia having launched in Korea not long ago. Uh, and then the last two in this uh, category is Filtracine. Um, they actually were on stage here just six months ago and are gonna be launching their first line of medical foods for cancer patients uh, coming up in September. And then Memphis Meats has a very big announcement they told us about, um, but we're gonna let them actually announce that uh, in the coming weeks. Um, the other category that people talk to us quite a bit about is therapeutics, because they wonder, given the typical model for funding, uh, Therapeutics companies, how do they fit in the bio? And we've actually seen a number of our alumni 
who've been really hitting some really meaningful milestones um, and actually creating novel science. The first one uh, from batch three is called Synthex, and they uh, discovered a, a novel mechanism of inducing cell death that they're leveraging across uh, their first number of indications in oncology and are moving into IND enabling studies. This is a team of two co-founders out of Toronto who came with just an idea and have since moved it um, nearly to IND. Uh, out of batch five is DNA Light um, doing oral gene therapy. And they've actually uh, created a, a new type of oral biologic where they're reprogramming um, cells in the body to release therapeutics um, for patients instead of taking recurrent treatment. Uh, the other two, uh, One Skin, a team out of Batch 3 and our very first longevity company, uh, has been working uh, with a novel compound to reverse skin aging and have shown in humans actually um, that they can decrease wrinkle count and increase skin score, which is a typical uh, standard in the industry. And lastly, another company that was here uh, just half a year ago is called Serenity, and they're working on unlocking redosable gene therapy. And in their uh, second mass study, they showed they can actually uh, induce tolerance to AAV and allow companies to redose. So they're now partnering with a number of companies, including uh, public ones as well. And lastly, um, in a few other categories where teams have hit really big milestones, uh, we have a company called Bflow out of batch six that uh, just completed a number of field studies with Driscoll as one of the largest berry producers in the world. And they've shown they can increase crop yields and fruit quality while also preventing population decline in bees. Uh, Prelis, a uh, local team out of UCSF, um, showed in one of their partnerships they can actually print functioning microvasculature, which is a huge milestone in being able to print functioning human organs, um, which is really turning technology into biology. Uh, Microworks from Batch 3, uh, which is making uh, real leather using mycelium mushroom roots, um, has been partnering with a number of global fashion brands. Uh, Neurocore from Batch 4 is entering their actual enabling phase 3 clinical studies for severe depression. And then lastly, uh, Catalog, a team out of our fourth batch, um, has scaled their DNA storage capabilities, which is letting them unlock uh, DNA-based computation, which is the first that they'll be announcing uh, in the press very, very soon. So these are just a few of our alumni um, that I want to highlight today. Um, and there's you know dozens more, but uh, now I'm gonna hand it over to Jude to tell you a bit more about the program. you're going to hear from today have all achieved significant scientific milestones in just four months, showing once again that the productization of science can happen very rapidly with focus, hard work, and a hustle for problem solving. We're very proud to have them share with you their results. And now I want to talk about the IndieBio team itself. We are extremely honored to have Poe Bronson join us full-time as strategy director. Poe is a seven-time New York Times best-selling author and has consulted and written about innovation since 1995. At IndieBio, Poe uses his macro lens of the world to help companies with commercialization and crafting their stories. Today's pitches are the product of Poe's mentorship. We're also extremely excited to announce two additions to our adjunct partner board, including the godfathers of bioengineering and synthetic biology, Jim Collins and George Church. And lastly, our team has been traveling around the world, championing entrepreneurship for planetary and human health, such as at conferences, as World Economic Forum, DLD, uh, Hello Tomorrow, and XPRIZE and universities as Harvard, MIT, Tulane, UCSB. Now I'd like to hand over the mic to Maya, our communications director, to talk about our community building efforts. At IndieBio, we are deeply committed to learning and growing together. A few of the ways that we've been doing this is by hosting highly curated dinner salons that bring together thought leaders in the space of climate change, neuroscience, psychedelic medicine, and longevity. This helps us to deeply understand the space better. Our season one podcast, which is now available on iTunes, have, called Designing Science, 
has brought in guests such as Steve Blank, June Yoon, David Eagleman, Tim Liu, and June Yoon. So we're very excited to be launching our second podcast season next week. So check it out on iTunes. Our community is a vital uh, part of our support and nourishment. We believe that getting our founders outside of the lab to build community is very important. That creates a sense of inclusiveness and family that will go far beyond the program. We're very proud of investing in our female founders. We host regular events that spotlight their leadership. We take the time to dive deeper into topics and create an environment that will foster change, real change for us all. So if you have any female founders, send them our way. We have many events that are uh, happening on a regular basis. Thank you. I'm going to give this over to Poe now. Hey. Um, the challenge of science storytelling is that every single day there's another breakthrough. And the gap between common knowledge and that leading edge grows ever far apart. So never has communicating well been so vital. Never has it been more important to make sure that people understand. What these startups are doing today, this afternoon, is truly a critical part of their evolution. So let's get off the stage and welcome the real stars of the show. Let's put our hands together for Indie Bio Batch 8. My name is Matt, co-founder and CEO of New Culture, and we're making cow cheese without the cow. So there's a global movement going on. School kids from all over the world in their thousands are now taking it upon themselves to protest on the streets. <coughs> they are demanding action on climate change because it's their future and they're fighting for it. And we don't just have to see these protests to witness the demand. Because over 70% of millennials and Gen Z are willing to pay higher prices for sustainable food products. And sustainability has never been more needed than for an industry we quite frankly don't hear enough about. The dairy industry. Being from New Zealand, where dairy is our biggest export, I've seen firsthand the amount of damage that this industry can cause. Where one dairy cow produces twice as much methane as a beef cow. And it's an industry that produces one of the most unsustainable of all food products. Cheese. A food that we never think of as harmful because it's such a unique part of our history and identity. With thousands of variations from all over the world that each tell a unique story. And when I think of cheese, I don't just think of the taste, but the smell, the texture, the way it's presented, the craft, of how it was made. Oh, but all cheese is great in all these different ways. The actual production of it is extremely unsustainable. So the question is, why aren't people buying sustainable cheeses? Because the only sustainable cheeses on the market today, plant-based vegan cheeses, simply don't work. The dairy components that make up dairy cheese are so unique that they're impossible to replicate with only plant-based options. And that's why the vegan cheeses we see today are either spreads or bad replicas of the hard cheeses. They don't melt well. They don't have the same mouthfeel. They simply don't act or taste like cheese. So we asked ourselves, what is responsible for those traits that we love about dairy cheese? Well, it turns out there's a group of proteins the casein proteins that are responsible for much of these traits. In milk, casein proteins form aggregates called casein micelles, super molecular structures that are very complex 
that are very unique, only been found in mammalian milk, and that are essential for cheese making. Because casein micelles make cheese melt, they make cheese stretch, they're responsible for the different textures we see in cheese, the hardness, the softness. Casein micelles represent the large gap we see between dairy cheese and sustainable cheese. But not for long. Because we are making dairy cheese with casein micelles without needing a single cow. With casein micelles we've crafted from individual casein proteins using the right mix of salts and other minerals to reform these magical structures. And as you can see behind me, they're almost indistinguishable to casein micelles down in cow's milk. Allowing us to create a new mozzarella that has all the traits, all the nutrition, all the characteristics of cow's milk mozzarella but without any of the unsustainable or unhealthy drawbacks. And we can see this in the data. You can think of the curve behind me as the journey of a bite of cheese. The higher the curve, the harder you have to bite down to complete the chew. Using purified case in my sounds, we made a proof of concept cheese that is almost identical in texture and softness when compared to cow's milk cheese. And you can see how far away vegan cheese really is. Furthermore, we ran a meltability and a stretch test on our cheese, where we heated it up with a torch to see how well it melts. And as you can see the video behind me, it melts just as well, if not better, than cow's milk cheese. And you tried doing this with vegan cheese. <laughs> we did a double blind taste test with a class that did better than chance at distinguishing our cheese versus cow's milk cheese. So the question is, how do we do this? How do we make casein proteins that form casein micelles? The answer is actually quite simple. We are using microbes to make our cheese proteins. The way it works is that we take our engineered microbe and we grow it in a plant-based solution. As it grows, it begins secreting casein proteins, which we form into those magical casein micelles. Once enough has been made, we simply swap out our engineered microbes with fresh cheese starter culture to continue the fermentation process of turning those proteins into cheese. And by doing it this way, by optimizing our process for cheese making, it changes everything. It allows us to reduce downstream processing, which in turn reduces costs, and finally enables us to develop this technology for the food industry. And we have a preliminary patent filed by Wilson Cincinnati to protect this process. And we know what happens when a good, sustainable product reaches the dairy market at scale. With the decline of dairy milk and the rise of plant-based milk. Now we translate this over to the cheese market with $136 billion. And those same conscious consumers, those same flexitarians, those same health conscious consumers, those same lactose intolerant consumers, those same vegans and vegetarians that are spending billions of dollars on plant-based milks, we buy our cheese. Because this demand is not just theoretical. We've gone up into the industry, onto large digital platforms, and received an overwhelmingly positive response. People are excited. This is the final frontier of the clean foods movement. We ran a wait list for people to try our cheese and have over 4,000 people signed up in under six weeks. Building this captivating story and this strong brand is how we will go to market. First in restaurants, but not just on a pizza, on a cheese platter, and a cellar by itself. Then as we scale, we'll move into fast food chains and eventually supermarkets. The new culture team consists of talented and passionate scientists from some of the world's top universities our advisory team are global experts in their respective fields, all together forming a team that has the drive, the skills, the passion, the commitment needed to revolutionise the cheese industry with a new culture. And that's why we're raising $2.8 million, with half the round already committed, to build the pilot process of our NT implementation system and take the first step in the clean cheese future. Now, we have 500 samples waiting for investors to try after this, and invite you to try some of our cheese and meet me after if you want to join our rounds. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. My name is Marcel. I'm a co-founder of Gavilan Biodesign. Every drug company attempting to treat cancer or infectious diseases faces the same problem, maintaining a durable response from their drugs. Even great drugs that work perfectly at first tend to fail months later <coughs> due to the emergence of drug resistance. At Gavilan, we're solving this problem. Making a great drug really comes down to modeling interatomic interactions correctly. And you may think that it looks something like this, but there's no such thing as standing still in biology. In a living cell, proteins are constantly vibrating and moving in an ensemble of conformations and shapes. This means we need a, we need a model dancing, wiggling, interacting molecules. At Gavilan, we use low residual machine learning with highly flexible physics-based energy models and super linear mathematically provable pruning algorithms. So, whereas others have to choose between accurate modeling or fast throughput, we can do both. Let me guide you into the nanometer space of drug design. This is a space measured in tenths of a nanometer, our angstroms. Here, these probe dots show the contacts and interactions between the drug and the protein. In this space, even the tiniest of motion is a difference between a drug that binds and one that clashes, a drug that succeeds and one that utterly fails. But just to make things harder, remember, drugs are constantly moving. This movement makes a challenge we drug designers have to make exponentially harder. Every drug company has to face this challenge. Many ignore the challenge altogether in design against static structures. Others design against a few discrete, rigid conformations. We are the only ones to model continuous movement. We use machine learning to learn the thermodynamic ensemble and model continuous flexibility across multiple degrees of freedom. Think of us as capturing video, whereas everyone else, at best, is taking snapshots. And whereas others screen libraries of stock molecules, we design from fragments, building new and de novo molecules that are custom and ideal to their targets, allowing us an increased hit rate, affinity, and specificity. And when we design drugs, we find compounds no one else would find. Because if they take a snapshot and conclude that the drug won't work, they also reject the possibilities around it. Just a tiny little movement. And that could have been the drug that we were all waiting for. And what this custom design of drugs and this continuous flexibility allows us to do is challenge the disease to a chess match. A chess match played through time, in which we don't only predict, but we design drugs that can overcome all possible on-target resistance mutations. So here we're using our continuous motion to accurately predict resistance mutations shown in red, while simultaneously using our fragment-based drug discovery technology to design a drug to overcome resistance. Eventually, we find a piece for which there is no good resistance mutations. We continue to grow the drug, increasing its affinity and specificity. What we're doing something here, what we're doing here is something that no other company can do. We're not only designing against the target today, but against all possible variations of the target in the future. In the end, we checkmate the disease. While at Duke, we have a long list of successful projects that validate our team, our designs, and our technology. From lysterics inhibitors in leukemia to protein-protein interaction inhibitors for cystic fibrosis. Moreover, our unique ability to predict resistance has been shown in 17 cancer drugs, multiple antibiotics, both retrospectively and prospectively. 
Let me show you one example. Working with Vaccine Research Center in Maryland, we wanted to redesign an antibody against HIV. They had a good starting point. It was an antibody that was able to neutralize roughly 68% of a panel of 179 clinically relevant HIV viruses. The designed antibody was not only five times more potent, but it was able to neutralize nearly 90% of that panel. And remember, HIV is the master in developing drug resistance. That antibody is currently in nine clinical trials. We formed Gavilon in December last year. It takes a few weeks for us to design a drug, and a little bit over three months to start getting the experimental validation. We design drugs with partners and internally. With partners, we get their compounds, do in silico optimization, they do experimental validation, and we get milestones and revenue share. Internally, Gavilon is developing its own pipeline. And what we're doing is we're using our unique ability to design custom and ideal molecules to go after targets that no one else can hit, the so-called undruggable proteins, like KRATs. In this model, we pay for the experiments up to pre-IND, at which point we partner to commercialize and market the acid. In a short amount of time since we joined Indibio, we have found partners to co-develop three different molecules, the first of which we have delivered already. We have up to eight figures in receivables from these projects, and I'm happy to announce that just today, we have started a preliminary study with one of the world's top 10 pharma companies. Internally, Gavlin is pursuing an undruggable target <coughs> in oncology. We already have initial hits against that target and extensive interest from investors on a potential spin-out. The founding team of Gavlin Biodesign has worked together for at least six years. Our skill sets range from applied mathematics to structural biophysics to computer science. Bruce Donald, whose lab we all come from, is a James B. Duke professor of computer science at Duke, one of the most important chair positions you can have at Duke. And we have brought in industry talent. Tim Gallagher brings in over 15 years of business development in the pharma space. And last, but definitely not least, we're happy to announce that Nancy Miller Rich has decided to join us. Nancy was part of the executive committee at Merck. She led their global strategy and business development including the commercialization of Keytruda, as well as leading their digital transformation. Our board of advisors is made of truly renowned scientists. These are some of the top scientists in the world, with Jane and Daniela both being McCarter Genius Fellowships Award winners, as well as members of the National Academy of Medicine, Science, and Engineering, respectively. Cynthia is the world's leader in interpretable ML, whereas Wei Tao is one of the top cited scientists in the world for his work on accurate quantum simulations. Bruce Teeter is one of the only other scientists to have developed methods to design resistance resilient drugs and one of the world's leaders in accurate computational protein and drug design. We are raising $3 million, of which about a third has already been committed. Our inability to design durable responses and to target undurable proteins has limited our therapeutic efficacy today. At Gavilon, we're going to change that. We're going to avenge those that we loved and lost against these terrible diseases, and we're going to work hard to save the lives of patients today. Join us. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Siv Watkins. I'm the CEO of Eleven Biomix. We use microbes to cure diseases on plants, specifically cannabis. <laughs> cannabis is a really big deal in this country. We produce something like 1,250 tons of this stuff every year. Each plant is worth around $1,500, and that's just today. The industry is experiencing a growth of around 25% every single year. 
250 tons of that, however, can't be used or sold as high-grade product and has to be rendered down to a kind of cannabis sludge beforehand. That represents a retail value of around two and a half billion in every single year that's lost to the industry. Why? Because of public enemy number one. This guy. This is powdery mildew. It's a fungal disease, and that 250 tons represents the 20% of every single harvest that is infected with this white stuff. The white stuff is an organism that sticks to the plant, produces these tiny structures called haustoria that poke into the plant cells and suck out the guts of the cell. It damages the plant. And growers will spend up to $10,000 per harvest trying to mitigate, prevent, or treat the effects of powdery mildew. And they will use biological pesticides, they will use chemical pesticides, they will use UV lamps. And what all of these methods have in common is that they're completely generic. None of them are tailored specifically for cannabis. So they're ineffective, and they can damage the plant too. Most importantly, because every single grower in this country is trying to treat the same disease with the same limited range of methods, we're seeing the development of very resistant strains. Powdery mildew is really hard to treat, and it's getting much, much harder. So if cannabis was growing on the side of a mountain in China somewhere 100 years ago, it would be much better at defending itself against diseases and pests like powdery mildew. In the wild, plants recruit microbes to help them fight disease. But cannabis isn't wild anymore. And today, it's grown like this. High density, and the plants themselves are so overbred to select for characteristics like high THC. The trade-off is that they just can't defend themselves as well as they used to be able to. What Leaven Biomix has done is mimic the natural process whereby plants recruit microbes to fight diseases for them. We've isolated an extensive catalogue of microbial organisms that will fight disease from cannabis biomes specifically. We can go into this catalogue, pick out the appropriate members and return them to the plants at therapeutic levels as a foliar spray. We can tailor this, right? We can tailor this to different parts of the country. We can tailor it to different types of grow, indoor, outdoor, greenhouse, hydroponic. We can tailor it to specific strains of plant. What we do is highly targeted, so it's very, very effective. It doesn't harm the plant because these microbes derive from the plant. And most importantly, we're not contributing to the development of resistance in powdery mildew. This is what it looks like. The left-hand panel, you can see a very sick leaf that's diseased with powdery mildew. 12 hours after we treated it, it was cured. And since we've been at Indie Bio, we've been validating our approach on experimental plants as well. The blue line here represents rates of infection in a plant called Skywalker. You can see that five days into the experiment, this poor thing was almost 50% covered in powdery mildew. The green arrows represent the points at which we treated it. By day 10, this plant was cured and the infection stayed away. We can also use this as a preventative measure. This plant is called Hurudi. On day seven, it was treated with one of our formulations. The following day, we challenged it with a very aggressive strain of powdery mildew. And we kept challenging it every day. An infection did not develop, and this plant retained its value for the rest of its life. We've also been performing larger scale agricultural trials. These data come from a grower in New Mexico who donated 40 plants of Jabberwocky. Jabberwocky is a really popular plant, but it's very hard to grow and extremely susceptible to powdery mildew. Here you can see between days 1 and 23 that these plants were very infected, to the point at which the grower was considering throwing them out. But they didn't throw them out, we treated them instead. And within a few days we had infection levels under control. By day 40, these plants were completely cured. So the yellow line here represents the point at which these plants would have to be sludged before they could be sold. The red line represents a total loss. The plants would be unusable. You can see that our treatment brought levels of infection below both of these lines very quickly. And the grower was so impressed by the knockdown capacity of what we were doing and how quickly it worked 
They went from being a collaborator to a customer. Because at its most infected but still usable, this plant is worth $300 per pound. And once we cured it, it was worth $1,200 per pound. So we have existing sales contracts uh, in New Mexico and other states. We have technical partnerships with industry leaders across the country, and this is how we're bringing it to growers. It's a subscription model. So a program in which we deal with cannabis pests at a cost of $10 per plant per month. In our home in New Mexico, that represents a market opportunity of $20,000 a month, just in New Mexico. And our margin is 96% at the moment. We want to have 100,000 plants under management by the end of next year. So to do this, we need to expand outside of New Mexico much farther. California, the Emerald Triangle, the East Coast. If we can do this, we estimate that we will be turning a profit by May of next year. We are developing a portfolio of IP based on the many numbers of microbes we've isolated that can do this work for us. We have filed a provisional patent working with Ingensity and Matrix Law, and clearly this approach can be applied to crops of all different types. So there is a potential here to capitalize on the general need for safe and effective alternatives to pesticides. I've been an environmental microbiologist for around 16 years. My partner Jeff has been in sales for seven years and in the cannabis industry for two. Our other co-founders and advisors have a range of expertise from business development, cannabis growing, sales in the cannabis industry. So an investment of $3 million is the difference between us staying in New Mexico and us reaching every single cannabis and hemp grower in the US and beyond. If you would like to join our round, please come and chat afterwards. Thank you. Hello, my name is Franco Idia. I'm the CEO of Casper Biotech, and we're powering the next generation of CRISPR diagnostics. For a moment, let me take you to Laguna Alta, a lake at an altitude of 4,000 meters in my home country, Argentina. This place is considered to be one of the most extreme environments in the world. And here, we discovered a new CRISPR-Cas12 enzyme. Its novelty is given by the difference it has in terms of percentage identity when compared to any other Cas. While still having the key catalytic amino acids which make it belong to the Cas12 family. We filed a provisional patent which includes not only this Cas, but also our own Cas9. You might know about CRISPR in terms of its gene editing application. At Casper, we're using CRISPR for something different. Through our Cas enzyme, we will revolutionize precision diagnostics by going to the genetic code of any DNA-based target. Doing this better than existing technologies, as identifying specific DNA sequences has been the evolutionary purpose of CRISPR in nature. This precise search functionality is complemented with the collateral activity ARCAS has, making it perfect for near instantaneous readouts. Here, you can see its performance for DNA degradation over time, which is achieved in less than 10 minutes. Initial results show RCAS has performed at par with the benchmark, or in the process of fully characterizing this. Freedom to operate will come from a license currently being negotiated with the correct CRISPR institution. Now, let me walk you through how we harness this enzyme as the tool for next generation diagnostics. RCAS <coughs> is bound to a guide RNA, which is complementary to the DNA sequence of the proposed target. Both components together generate a CRISPR-Cas complex. If the DNA corresponding to the target is present in the sample, the Cas will find it and cut it. After doing this, it will go crazy, cutting all DNA in a non-specific manner. We evidence this collateral cut activity by adding a reporter system, a ferrochrome and a quenchum. So, if the target pathogen is present in the sample, a fluorescent signal is triggered. We're taking this groundbreaking technology to build a device to diagnose it all within hospitals. 
providing results in less than 30 minutes with minimal sample preparation and an atomolar sensitivity. And this is why medical experts are very excited with what we're doing. Right now, they use mostly PCR-based solutions to diagnose. When comparing face-to-face -face our technology with qPCR, we're able to obtain a 20% increase in sensitivity, a 30% increase in robustness, and best of all, we achieve this for just one third of the cost. The Casper platform will unify all detections at a molecular level, being capable of diagnosing for infectious diseases and genetic mutations. And we're starting with antimicrobial resistance as our primary indication, commonly known as the superbox. There are currently two main techniques for this diagnosis. The first is the culture, which takes two to three days for results to be available. Other options include automated systems, but this requires a culture enrichment, making the process last more than 24 hours in total. We will enable the diagnosis of antimicrobial resistant genes in a direct from blood format, providing results in less than one hour. Reducing the unnecessary use of wide spectrum antibiotics and shortening the period of patient isolation. Within a value based US healthcare system, less time in the hospital means more money for the hospital. And we estimate this impact in savings to exceed the billion dollars. We have done validation for the main resistances, this being KPC, NDM, and OXA, detecting for the conserved and distinct sequence of each of these targets, with our readout result being fluorescent. The downward slope corresponds to proportional dilutions in target concentration. And as this is highly correlated with the total amount of fluorescence, not only can we detect, but we can also quantify the amount of target pathogen present in the sample. The technology is there. Our only next step is to integrate this into a device. And we already started doing so. While here in IndieBio, we developed a disposable chip which integrates CRISPR with microfluidics. Our device will sell to hospitals for $5,000. Our business model will be based on the cartridge. This one will sell for $40 to $60 each, with a gross margin of 50% through distributors and 70% through, through, through direct sales, while also taking into account the corresponding CPT codes for each of our indications. CRISPR is set to disrupt what is now a PCR-based molecular diagnostics market estimated to be worth $25 billion, only taking into account point of care. Other startups, such as Mammoth and Sherlock, are also using CRISPR, but they're focused on other targets, hence using alternative formats. Our go-to-market strategy has made one of these pioneer companies a possible partner rather than a competitor. Our system is the ideal solution for hospitals, and we're seeing this interest being generated from an early stage. We're currently doing a research-based pilot and are receiving LOIs from various medical institutions. We really move fast, and this is the team that's making it happen. Felipe Moncarda, our PhD in CRISPR system, with a combined experience of more than 10 years with this technology. I am a second-time founder, with my previous experience being a successful startup acquisition. The rest of the team is made up by people dedicated to other core areas, such as bioinformatics, microbiology, and synthetic biology. Our advisors are experts in infectious diseases, diagnostics, engineering, and FDA regulatory pathway. We're currently raising a seed round to advance in the development of our device and our cartridge technology. To then, seek approval as a 510K with a prior clinical validation. Our seed round for $3 million is now open. Join us in that venture for transforming molecular diagnostics while generating one of the industry's most exciting CRISPR gas IP portfolios. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Helen Chen. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Guided Clarity. We create medical food for functional aging. At some point in all of our lives, there is a rude moment of awakening to the fact that we cannot eat the same thing as we were younger without gaining weight. Our metabolism simply slows down. Then there's a slow rise of chronic inflammation that's making more aches and pain in the body, slower recovery from the fall or from the flu. When the two opposing trends come to a critical junction, that's when aging becomes problematic. 
At Guided Clarity, our mission is to close this gap. We do this by studying a tiny cellular structure that's responsible for metabolism and inflammation. The mitochondria, the powerhouse, the battery of each cell. We don't just have one or two mitochondria per cell. We have thousands of mitochondria in each cell to provide energy for us 24-7. However, as we get older, some of the mitochondria become leaky, less efficient, and we become sluggish. Worse yet, some of these mitochondria become leaky and spilling out all these toxic material, damaging DNA, causing aging and health decline. There is a natural process within our body called mitophagy that can declutter these dysfunctional mitochondria. However, as we get older, when we need it the most, this process also slows down. Medical research has shown that if we can enhance the decluttering process, we can function better, move better, and live longer. At Guided Clarity, we have found a molecule that does just that. This molecule is made naturally in our body by our gut, by two components of mother's milk. When a baby drinks mother's milk, this milk milk protein is broken down in the stomach into bits called peptides. Then they can wrap around this milk mineral and go into the cells and start the mitochondria decluttering process. But the tricky part is, you cannot get the same effects from drinking cow's milk. Because this protein is the most abundant protein in mother's milk, a very small amount in cow's milk. It took our team of biologists and dairy experts more than five years to identify it, purify it, and concentrate it. We have IP protection on both the manufacturing process and the compound structure. When we put this compound on the cells, within a few hours, we see four gene expression change significantly. Two mitophon genes are increased to start a decluttering process. Simultaneously, the cell death signals are suppressed to protect the cells. After decluttering the mitochondria, the leaky ones especially, we see an increase in the energy output 20% more energy per cell on average, as measured by ATP, the cellular energy output. That's how this molecule can improve metabolism. Let's look at inflammation, the other key driver of aging. In animal studies, the mice that have ingested these molecules for a week, they have dramatically less inflammation than the control mice. Multiple inflammatory factors are lowered not just in the blood, but in various organs. Here we show an example of reduced lung inflammation. And we know it is safe in humans, because we've conducted a clinical safety study in 73 healthy young volunteers at Baylor University, showing no clinical side effects and trends of improved insulin sensitivity, lowering inflammation, and better movement. And now we are ready to take this product to people over age 65 who will benefit from this the most. <laughs> we welcome you to come to our booth after this. In the meantime, we designed and built a mini factory that is producing a small scale. And in six months, we'll be ready to transition to a pilot plant. And all these benefits are being packaged into a medical food to boost mitochondrial health for the aging population. Our first product, MitoNova, will be available online direct to consumer and also in select clinics. The retail price will be under $80 with 5x margin for us. And we have a great team that can execute this. My co-founder, Olaf Mostad, is from Nestle, specially in the manufacturing and marketing of food innovation. I'm a molecular biologist by training with more than 10 years of pharmaceutical experience. Our clinical collaborators are really excited to test these medical foods. They are experts in the field of healthy aging. And importantly, we have Mr. Peter Hutt as a regulatory advisor.
He's a former FDA chief counsel who wrote the regulation on medical food. Our regulatory path is simple. Mitonova is made from ingredients of milk. We can declare grass status, generally recognized as safe. The health and wellness market is very noisy. To rise above that, we'll conduct two clinical studies to enable health claims on our product label. Critically, it will allow us to sell through clinics to nutritionists who are all eager to help their patients but need the clinical data to do so. I want to give you a glimpse of what's in the future for us. We're engaging Mount Sinai to test Mitonova on joint health, which affects one-third of adults, preventing active lifestyle. We're engaging Texas A&M Institute of Aging to test how our compound can improve lung health, the fourth large, largest leading cause of death. By moving the needle in these health parameters, we'll be able to make major impact in functional aging. We're raising $3 million of funding to conduct these studies, to build our team, our brand, our production line, so we can be launch ready in 18 months. We have already have $1 million of commitment. I'd like to have you join us in this round, and together we can be at the forefront of food and medicine. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mark, and I'm a material scientist from Decomer Technology. We live in a glorious era of convenience. Convenience makes people's lives easier, simple, and pleasurable. But consumers, CPG companies, and progressive governments are waking up to the harm that our convenience has caused to the environment. Consumers feel the pain, but have no viable alternatives. Personally, I find it unacceptable to see single-use plastic packaging that takes centuries to decompose, and it's also quite disgusting that this plastic does not only end up in the nature, but is also shredded into microplastics that enter our food chain and ultimately our bodies. We, at Decomer Technology, have developed a novel water-soluble and edible packaging material. So, now you can have your convenience and eat it too. <laughs> As it's completely edible and plant-based, then it also degrades like food does. No need to worry about eating plastic. These ingredients are FDA approved, hypoallergenic and acceptable to sensitive customer segments. Our standard material is transparent, tasteless and odorless, but we can add flavors, colors and labeling if needed. Importantly, our material is water-soluble. Now, there are already some water-soluble materials out there, but they're made from petroleum, animal-based ingredients, or unscalable plant-based feedstock, which makes them unsustainable or expensive to produce. On the other hand, we use a plant-based blend of mostly polysaccharides that on a large scale are cheap and readily available. Solubility is an important feature for us, given the broad range of applications. So, in the three last months, here at Indivio, we have worked hard to be able to tune its dissolution speed according to application, as well as change its mechanical properties from rigid to flexible and stretchable. Depending on the application, we can also tune it to dissolve in hot water, cold water, or both. We also conducted initial experiments that allow us to make the material more water resistant to be used in general food packaging over the long run. But let's see some prototypes that demonstrate this uh, concept of tunability. Here you can see our flavoring package for, say, noodles or ramen that has been designed to dissolve in warm water. As it's completely edible, then you can take the package, put it into warm water, wait a second, and it melts. But if the customer decides to tear the package open in a conventional way, 
it's also okay and does not produce any plastic waste. This was a test of distribution speed. To add to functional performance, we successfully prototyped our material to withstand most enzymes found in common detergents. This allows us to target the most uh, widespread water soluble film material on the market, which is polyvinyl alcohol. It is a petroleum based polymer that is used for, for example, water soluble detergent and dishwashing pots. We can offer a 100% plant based alternative to that. And as the whole detergent industry is moving more and more towards using plant based ingredients, it only makes sense to have the pot material also made from plants, not petroleum. And we're so used to throwing away plastic that its market value is often overlooked. But if you think of the volume of consumption of these products, then you might see it differently. For example, 20 billion detergent pots and 100 billion raven packages are consumed every year. But as we continue R&D to add to our portfolio of tunable products, then we're also near to a market trend. We're going to market with water-soluble honey packages, which is a non-sticky solution for making consuming honey in drinks more convenient. The user simply takes a package, adds it to one's warm drink, and can enjoy it. We have all experienced pouring honey into our tea only to get sticky fingers and difficult to clean jars. Airlines, cafes, and food retailers are already waiting for our product, and we're happy to announce that we recently received an order request worth half a million dollar, dollars with many more potential clients waiting. Given this high interest, even marginal market penetration allows us to target a $70 million annual revenue in our primary target markets with special interest from Asia. All we have to do now is service this initial demand, and by acquiring necessary machinery, we will become cash flow positive right at seed stage with margins as high as 85%. Our vision is to be leaders in sustainable plant-based packaging, being versatile and span industries, to empower customers with real alternatives. Some of the world's largest CPG companies saw this value, have requested samples, and we have been in active negotiations to chart a path forward. The field of customers' pressure and the increasing regulatory pressure for sustainability. Differentiation through innovative packaging might decide future market shares for such companies. We have a clear roadmap to scale industrial production, to unlock these impactful verticals, and to kick off testing cycles for such global players parallel to our own products. We have successfully tested industrial scale production of the material in rolls, and we know that this process is easily scalable. Decover will patent all these different materials compositions, methods of use of machinery, as well as individual products in the home care and food industries. We have filed provisional patent for all of the above. Our IP is handled by Shirley Resetman, who has led large patent portfolios for large life science companies such as DuPont. I am a material scientist specialized in biopolymer materials. Kelly has a background in economics and is responsible for business development. We have also created a wide network of advisors and partners from Europe, Asia and now also here in America. In the next 18 months, we will hire sales, branding and marketing and R&D experts as well as set up pilot production. This would enable us to offer smaller batches of material to our business to business partners but could serve as a full-scale production line for our own products to start with sales within 12 months. To accomplish this, we are raising $1.2 million. We cannot yet eliminate all plastic waste issues in the world, but step by step, we can move towards reaching that goal. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Michael Wyman, CEO of Beeline Therapeutics. One of the most exciting new fields of medicine today is harnessing the power of our own immune systems to attack disease. Our immune systems can turn on responding to infections. They can also turn off protecting our unhealthy cells. A lot of cell therapies today focus on turning on the immune system deploying killer and helper T-cells against cancer. 
But what about turning off the immune system? That's largely been overlooked by the field of cell therapy so far. And it's the turning off that holds the key to attacking disease caused by an immune system that's more active than we'd like. That's the focus of T regulatory cells that regulate other immune cells in our bodies. For example, a killer T cell can mistakenly recognize our own healthy tissue as dangerous, attack it, cause cell death, leading to disease symptoms like inflammation. The Treg may be ineffective at suppressing the response in this case. At Beeline, we're supercharging the Treg, empowering it to find and bind the healthy tissue. And once it gets there, to release cytokines that interfere with the killer T cells' activities. <laughs> We're taking T regulatory cells, T regs, out of the patient and then modifying them to better localize and to function better, and then putting the modified cells back into the patient. And specifically, we're making two key changes to the cell's DNA. First, we're putting in a targeting receptor, a chimeric antigen receptor, that lets the Treg localize to the right place in the body. Second, we're dramatically increasing the Treg's ability to secrete, to make cytokines that help the Treg suppress the immune response. Scientists have been trying for decades to put these same cytokines into patients by mouth and by injection. The results typically haven't been very good, largely because not enough of the cytokine ends up locally, near the site where the immune system is too active. And if you just keep putting more and more in, there's too much toxicity, broad immunosuppression. Putting in a localized Treg lets us transcend this problem. The Treg can localize to the right place, and then it can release the cytokine there. We're setting the stage for a living drug that can sense its environment and know how much of the cytokine to release. We're cutting the DNA with an enzyme and knocking into a genetic locus without interrupting the gene's normal function. Only the cells that are fully edited successfully go back into patients. We're setting up a cell therapy that is safe, predictable, and tunable. Unlike random viral vector integration, we choose precisely the site in the DNA we want to knock into. Expression of the therapeutic we knock in will adopt expression of the gene we've chosen to knock into. And from the thousands of genes expressed in Treg, we choose the one with just the right level of expression and regulation to tune therapeutic expression, boring on the natural regulation of our genes. And we're one of the few groups anywhere in the world that can operationalize this approach with training from some of the world's leading labs at non-viral T-cell engineering. So that's the concept. Let's talk about what we've done. We've successfully knocked in a chimeric antigen receptor. You see in this flow cytometry data a population of cells expressing a CAR. We've created a cell that can localize, and that's the first step in our program to develop novel targeting receptors that will separate us from competition. And we've successfully knocked in an immunosuppressive cytokine. Here in this flow cytometry data, you see the population of cells expressing the key immunosuppressive cytokine, IL-10. We've not only expressed it, but secreted it, which is what you see in the histogram on the right. And to the best of our knowledge, we are the first therapeutics company to publicly announce that we've knocked in overexpressed and secreted this key therapeutic protein out of a Treg. So that's the technology that we'll combine to fuel our platform. Let's talk about how we'll apply it. There are a host of indications we can address. Transplantation is the perfect first target. Here our immune system can cause us to reject the transplanted organ that's been put into us. And the role of Tregs in inducing tolerance is well characterized. And transplantation is a massive market that can transform patient lives. There are more than 21,000 kidney transplants in the United States every year. That number could actually double with better solutions. 
Today we use non-specific drugs that suppress the patient's immune system to prevent rejection. But those same drugs suscept the patient to infections and even cancer. One of the two leading drugs is designated a group one carcinogen by the World Health Organization. And those drugs don't even work well for all classes of transplants. Using a Treg to induce tolerance can unlock transplanting other organ types, like pancreatic islet transplants, where more than a million potential patients today can't get the transplants due to the risk that the islets really won't survive in the patient. In our short time here at IndyBio, we've achieved our key technical milestones, and in the next 18 months, we've mapped out developing novel targeting receptors and a series of in vivo efficacy and safety studies to get us to the clinic, where we'll move fast, leveraging FDA breakthrough and fast track programs. Our proprietary technology is protected by provisional patents on compositions and matter and methods filed with Wilson Glycine. And we've assembled a superstar team to get this to the clinic. That includes Dmitry Simeonov, who trained at one of the world's leading labs for non-viral T-cell engineering, Chris Chavez, who's a CAR T-cell engineer from Addison Bio with training at Stanford, and myself with over a decade of business development experience. And we've attracted a scientific advisory board that includes two of the world's leading immunologists, a cell therapy industry veteran, the chief of pediatric transplantation at UT Southwestern, and the man who pioneered islet transplantation and remains the leader in the field today from University of Alberta. Cell therapy is currently the future for treating autoimmune disease and transplantation. Help, it, help us make it more of a reality today. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Paul, I'm CEO and co-founder of Group Health Ecosystems and we turn sunlight into seafood. And in the bio, we built a scale prototype of the machine that makes this happen. Let me show you how Lara, or land-based, automated, recirculating aquaculture works. In the top, which is exposed to sunlight, our primary energy source, we grow algae in these tubular structures. We feed this algae to zooplankton, the species that you see here is called Daphnia, which is in turn the natural food for fish, like this bluegill, and for shrimp. Now by recirculating the wastewater back to the top, we in essence create a completely natural ecosystem. An ecosystem where these organisms are never exposed to microplastics or pesticides. An ecosystem that, just like in nature, produces organic shrimp and fish for human consumption. But recreating and stabilizing an ecosystem is extremely difficult. This is why LARA is automated. We use water quality sensors, computer vision and machine learning to optimize population dynamics of every single organism within our system. Algae, zooplankton and fish. But because Lara is constantly exposed to sunlight and potentially very high temperatures, we also have to take care of thermal management. Now, we tackle this problem by utilizing the thermal mass of the water within our system to either store or release heat as required. Our next step is to scale up to 40-foot shipping containers in size, which we will do in the next six months. A stack like this produces premium organic seafood for $5 a pound. This is factoring in OPEX and CAPEX. Because of the modularity of the system, we are able to scale to football fields in size, feeding cities and even countries. Now this approach is completely unique. We in essence decouple the production of animal protein from the ocean and from agriculture itself. We don't need fish meal, we don't need soybeans, we don't need rain, and we don't care about heat waves. We are able to produce premium, organic, 
and sustainable seafood close to the consumer on demand on any piece of land. We have a business model where we sell these tags at a 50% margin on the sales price of $50,000. In addition, we charge recurring managing fees of $2,500 of every pound of seafood produced. We just signed a letter of intent with Singapore's largest caterer, SAT. Now, SAT supplies two of the world's biggest airlines, processing 100 tons of seafood every single month. They want to source everything from sustainable sources by 2023. We're also talking to partners, infrastructure developing companies from Dubai and the Middle East. Now, these countries have to import almost 100% of their food. They see Lara as an opportunity to not only decrease the dependency of food imports, but to become exporters themselves, fully utilizing their geographical, unique selling proposition, a lot of land and a lot of sun. Perfect conditions for Lara. To make this happen, we have assembled a great team that combines expertise in biology, energy engineering, and computer science. Blue Planet Ecosystems is also supported by a great advisory board. Natasha Nugliari is a renowned expert in industrial algae cultivation. Adrian Barnes invented shrimp farming, industrial shrimp farming, over 30 years ago and introduced tilapia production into Great Britain. Prince Khalid bin Al-Walid is a member of Breakthrough Energy Ventures together with Bill Gates and is able to open most doors we need to cross for business leaders and political leaders in our target market. Now, our company just got founded in December of 2018. In February, we moved to San Francisco and during our time here we built four iterations of our prototype, the final iteration you can see standing outside. In the next 18 months, we will build two iterations of our full-scale Lara system running through at least two harvesting cycles. We signed a research partnership with a Portuguese university, which is an expert in aquaculture. They will be stress testing our system so we are able to deliver Lara to our clients by the first quarter of 2021. We just opened up our seed round of $2.8 million, of which 30% is already committed. So if you want to participate in our round, if you have further questions, please visit us outside. Thank you. Hey everyone, my name is Alex Lewis. I'm co-founder and CEO of Electroactive Technologies, where we are working to power cities with waste. Almost 40% of the food produced in the world is wasted, a staggering amount. This waste is expensive to manage and is an environmental catastrophe as a leading source of methane emissions. But what if this problem was actually an opportunity? What if food waste was the starting point for solving one of the biggest problems on the planet? Production of affordable, zero emission fuels. My co-founder and I started studying this at Oak Ridge National Laboratory more than five years ago. Oak Ridge was home to the Manhattan Project and is now one of the largest DOE science and energy laboratories. There, we focused on a special electron-producing microbe. Now, this microbe exists naturally in the soil to break down iron, but we evolved it through targeted evolution to work in our system, which turns food waste into hydrogen, a zero-emission fuel. Now, to more effectively break down complex food waste to make hydrogen, we pair our electron-producing bacteria with hundreds of other microbes. And this microbial community has been specifically designed to work synergistically to produce electrons from waste. Now, this, these microbes grow as a biofilm on the anode, which actively extracts the electrons and drives hydrogen production at the cathode to make hydrogen in our microbial electrolysis cell. Our work, with, work at Oak Ridge was patented and now has been licensed exclusively to electroactive technologies for producing hydrogen from waste. 
And we are already doing this at commercial rates, as you can see from the data shown here, for a continuous 30-hour experiment. Now to scale up our individual cells producing hydrogen, they can be replicated and stacked together to make larger systems. What you see on the left here is our prototype in IndyBio, which is a stack of four cells with a 30-fold increase in size compared to what we were doing at Oak Ridge. Now out in the field, our shipping container size unit will be a much larger stack, consisting of 30,000 to 60,000 cells. It'll produce 100 kilograms of hydrogen per day and be paired with a food liquefier and hydrogen compressor. And as a stack, this system is modular, so it can be scaled up or down to meet the needs of the customer. And these needs, as well as the market opportunity, are greatest here in California. Looking at the hydrogen side, our pathway can qualify for low carbon fuel credits worth up to $4 per kilogram. Meanwhile, on the waste side, California has a mandate to divert 75% of the organic waste currently going to the landfill by 2025. To achieve this, waste haulers have to offer organic waste collection but they have very limited options for processing it, which our system can address. Taking food waste from these haulers, we can generate revenue on the front end through waste tipping fees and on the back end with sales of our hydrogen at $6 per kilogram. Collectively, we can realize a margin of 41 to 48%, and this was without factoring in the subsidy available here in California. Our conversations and traction with potential customers and partners on both sides of the market indicate our price points will make us very cost competitive. This traction has recently culminated into two major deals that we're really excited to announce. We have an LOI with a major waste logistics company and an MOU with a leading hydrogen supplier. Both these companies are national and can handle a lot of volume. So as we scale up to increase our volume, our costs come down rapidly. What's important to know here is we can rely on the established manufacturing of fuel cell stacks as our system can be assembled in a very similar way but with cheaper materials. And with that subsidy available here in California, we can enter the market here earlier and start fulfilling contracts within two years. As we continue to increase our volume and optimize our stack operation, we can expand outside of the state into other countries by year four. And the worldwide market has over a billion tons of food waste to process every year. The hydrogen we can make from this is worth $78 billion. The World Economic Forum recently came out with a statement that hydrogen is no longer the fuel of the future, it's already here. Major companies like Toyota, Shell, Walmart, and Amazon are investing heavily in both hydrogen and fuel cells. And a roadmap was recently laid out by the Hydrogen Council where hydrogen can, can contribute 18% of total global energy, worth $2.3 trillion by 2050. We're making a future where waste is no longer wasted, where people can feel proud to live in their cities and be reminded of it every time they ride the bus and fill up their car. The team we have to execute on this vision starts with myself and co-founder Vijay Barole. I'm an expert in developing and controlling complex microbial communities and advanced this technology during my PhD, which led to the highest public group publicly reported productivities in these type of systems. Abijit is a original inventor on the technology and brings 20 plus years of experience as a scientist at Oak Ridge. We have also begun forming an advisory board with technical, financial, and industry experience that can really drive the company forward. Pinnikin Patel was the former R&D VP at Fuel Cell Energy, which has technology being used by Toyota. Jim Petrecki was the former VP of Business Development at Plug Power, a major fuel cell company here in the US, with their fuel cells being used by Amazon and Walmart. Finally, Lynn Youngs, our financial advisor, has held multiple executive level positions with successful exits in multiple startups. Over the coming months, we'll be progressing through our next set of milestones, generating additional long-term data with different food waste speed stocks with the help of the Innovation Crossroads program. We will also be moving on to pilot studies and forming partnerships with key industry players under the H2 Refuel program, sponsored by Toyota and Shell. From here, we will develop our downstream integration and manufacturing plan to begin generating revenue within two years. To accomplish this, we are raising a seed round of $1.9 million, of which we have already committed 66%. Please come find us to talk about joining our round, and I ask all of you to join our cause to power your city with waste. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Kevin, co-founder and CEO of Biomsense, and we're revolutionizing microbiome discovery. Your gut microbiome is the most powerful therapeutic ever discovered. 
It can fight cancer, elevate your mood, and even determine if life-saving drugs will work for you. Best of all, it can be changed, meaning we can control it for better health. That's why over the past 13 plus years, well over $3 billion has been invested in this space. However, something is missing, and even after all that time and money, we still barely understand it. Now, on the surface, this doesn't make any sense. But as scientists in space, like company co-founder Dr. Jack Gilbert, and the problem is obvious, it's death. The microbiome is incredibly complex and changes rapidly, meaning dense time series data, ideally daily, is required to truly understand it. The problem is the tools to get that data can't scale, and without it today, getting a full understanding of the microbiome is impossible. Let me visualize the problem. This is a graph of the patient microbiome over a 75-day period. Today, scientists rely on snapshots of the microbiome as represented by the five vertical slices. As you can see, this leaves huge gaps in the data where the scientist is essentially blind, which is a problem because this is what actually happened in that patient microbiome, where we see massive swings over the course of an eight-day illness. Now, from a treatment perspective, this event is critical because a change in health is tied to a change in the microbiome. And it was there the whole time. You just needed far more data to actually see it. The problem is getting this much data can cost up to $10,000 per patient per month, which is about the same per patient per month as a phase three oncology clinical trial. Until that changes, scientists will keep taking snapshots, and this critical data will remain invisible. And that's why Biomsense is developing an integrated hardware, software, and database platform to massively scale microbiome data. Our enabling technology is a novel microfluidic biosensor that's installed in the patient home, becoming the first tool to continuously track the gut microbiome. We combine this with a time series analytics platform and longitudinal reference database to create the first full stack microbiome data solution, capable of generating daily microbiome data for only $300 per patient per month. For this to be possible, you need to take a wet lab, automate it, and then put it in the patient bathroom. So, during your bio, that's exactly what we did. Our MVP works by attaching to a patient's home toilet, where it passively collects a small stool sample every time they use the bathroom. This is then sent to our proprietary microfluidic system, developed over many months in collaboration with the University of Chicago, that isolates and stores the microbial DNA for less than 10 cents per run. A few weeks ago, we processed our first human samples through the MVP and successfully sequenced them in a third-party lab. This is a critical milestone because it validates our system is removing major sample contaminants, which means our MVP is nearly ready for first use in the field. The impact of the data we can generate is so high that with just our MVP, we oversubscribe our pilot program within weeks. And the pilots we selected from Mayo Clinic can the microbiome predict recurrence in post-surgical colon cancer patients? From UCSF, can the microbiome identify and or control incoming multiple sclerosis attacks? From the University of Chicago, how does the microbiome change efficacy of immunotherapies for triple negative breast cancer patients? And from Harvard's Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, how does the microbiome influence the risk and progression of early onset cancer patients? These are world-renowned institutions asking incredibly important clinical questions, for which time series microbiome data has never before been explored, meaning what we find could permanently change the clinical approach to these conditions, our pilots. I showed you what we built, but this shows you what it can do. We generate revenue with a single per patient per month charge to the investigator of $300. This dramatically reduces the cost to the investigator, but because the average microbiome trial is nearly 240 patients, we generate an average of 72,000 in MRR per trial. There are over 1,000 of these trials active today, and because the microbiome is such a red-hot space, this is growing at 30% per year. And this is the first part of our model. The second is data. Starting with the pilots, we'll be generating research quality data with clear clinical relevance at an unprecedented scale. Within two years, we'll have the largest and most valuable microbiome database in the world, and the only one with dense time series data. This enables enormous revenue upside via licensing, with one comparable deal being well over 500 million, and cross-study reproducibility ensures the data has strong network effects, 
blocking new entrants, and giving biomsets a sustainable burst mover advantage. We're starting in clinical research, but plan to rapidly expand. As we support the discovery of new microbiome-based biomarkers and therapeutics, the clear next step is to implement this clinically as part of the <coughs> diagnostics market. And finally, our ultimate vision is to become a universal consumer product, being installed in everyone's homes and allowing all of us to track and understand our microbiomes for better health. Our team is ideal to execute. I bring over seven years of healthcare experience, including my last role as Chief Operating Officer of a Pharma Coach Genomics Startup. Dylan Nichols leads product. He's an experienced bioengineer who's brought both macro and micro scale medical devices to market. Just a few weeks ago, we hired Naveed, who helped develop our proprietary microfluidic system as an advisor, and was so excited by the opportunity that he decided to join the team full time to help us scale. Dr. Gilbert is a world-renowned microbiome expert and runs one of only six labs in the world that's developed robust tools for microbiome time series analytics. And finally, Dr. Tay is a microfluidics expert at the University of Chicago who provides both his expertise and the vast resources available through his lab. We have two provisional patents already filed around our solution and plan on aggressively expanding this as development continues. Starting in clinical research allows us to be designated research use only, completely eliminating regulatory barriers until we decide that the opportunity of clinical use outweighs the cost of regulation. And with no regulatory barriers in the way, we can start generating our first revenue and data within 12 months. Today, we have the MVP and the customers. All we need now is engineering. And that's why I'm excited to announce that the Hardware Accelerator Hacks will be participating in our seed, offering their proven hardware development program to dramatically reduce our time and cost of pilot prototypes. With this complete, we will then execute the pilots, integrate our low-cost screening assay into the biosensor, then finalize the platform, at which point we'll be ready to rapidly scale. So today, we're looking for $1.5 million to fund our execution strategy. We have 500,000 already committed and are looking to close by the end of July. Thank you. Hi everyone. My name is Michelle Zhu. I'm the CEO of Tinctorium and I want to talk about everyone's favorite wardrobe stick. Your jeans. Look around you. Jeans are everywhere. That's what makes denim a hundred billion dollar market. What if I told you that the core ingredient, central to giving your jeans that blue faded look, is actually toxic? Today, over 99% of the jeans in your closet are being made with chemically synthesized indica. The denim industry's dirty secret is that that stuff is made under dangerous conditions and polluting our planet. The problem with indigo today is actually twofold. The first is a chemical synthesis process that is not only highly petroleum based, but also relies on known poisons like formaldehyde and cyanide to produce. On top of that, because indigo crystallizes so quickly, it isn't water soluble. And so what that means is that to actually use it as a dye, you have to add equal parts of <coughs> water polluting chemical reducing agents. Well, here at Tinctorium, we figured out a way to holistically resolve the indigo problem with a nature inspired process. Our solution is making indigo with completely renewable sources, like sugar and microbes. We program and grow bacteria in order to secrete an indigo precursor. That traps the indigo in a water-soluble state, putting a pause on the indigo formation process, until we're ready for the point of dying, at which point we combine the precursor with an enzyme, releasing the blue color, and thereby eliminating any need for reducing agents. You can see the process happen before your eyes. This technology was invented by my co-founder, Dr. Tammy Shu, during her PhD at Berkeley, where we also filed our patent. The Tinctorium owns an exclusive agreement with Berkeley over that IP. 
we've proven that our solution works. And not just in a lab, either. Over the last four months at IndieBio, we've been hard at work scaling up our technology from 10 liter to 300 liter fermentation sizes. And that gave us enough dye to run our solution through an actual industrial machine. And just a couple weeks ago, we made this. This is proof that our solution works as a plug-in into the existing supply chain. That means we can literally take these clean dye threads, run it through a denim production line, and we would have a pair of the most sustainable jeans on the planet. See, today, consumers are taking a stand for sustainability in ways that we've never seen before. You've already watched the revolution take hold of the plant-based meats market. People are paying attention to how the food that they put in their body is made. And it's only a matter of time before they start directing their attention to how the clothes they put on their body every day are made as well. In fact, we have survey data to show this. We talked to over 700 consumers who, when educated about the toxic impacts of denim production, almost 80% told us they wanted to buy more sustainably dyed jeans. On top of that, we recruited a team of influencers with over 400,000 in following who, when they heard about what we were doing, volunteered to help spread our message. And that's going to be the critical first step in our go-to-market strategy. Building brand and educating consumers. That's why we're starting by releasing our own line of high-end, limited edition jeans just to get the conversation started with consumers about sustainable debt. Next, we'll move to co-branded lines with our first premium partners in revenue sharing arrangements. And finally, in the long term, We'll move to mass market partnerships because our vision is that every pair of jeans can be better made. And the denim industry has embraced us. We've already signed LOIs with two of the world's largest denim brands. They're eager to track our progress because they've known about the problem with indigo for decades. And they're under enormous pressure to adopt more sustainable practices. See, brands are growing attuned to the fact that in order to stay relevant, they have to wake up to the true cost of fashion. Like the true cost of indigo when you actually take into account the environmental harm. And here at Tintorium, as we scale, we'll provide brands the opportunity to mitigate risk and grow brand equity for just the price of a dollar more per pair of jeans. And as we do that, we're going to unlock untapped potential in the indigo market. By accounting for the true cost of indigo, we have the opportunity to grow the market and command a monopoly. And this is the perfect team to do this. Tammy brings over 10 years of experience in bioengineering. Drew Ross, our new downstream processing lead, brings over seven years of industry experience. And I bring a background in business operations and marketing. But on top of that, it's personal for me, because my family owned their own denim and apparel business. And I'm committed to reinventing the industry I grew up in. We're honored to be advised by a team of experts as well, at the intersection of biotechnology and fashion. UC Berkeley bioengineering professor John Duber, CSO of Bolt Threads, David Breslauer, and world-renowned denim designer, Adriana Goldschmidt, otherwise known as the godfather of denim. We're raising two and a half million dollars in order to launch our first line of jeans in the next few years. And that's gonna involve strain engineering and purification work to rapidly prototype fabric concepts and scale up to 10,000 liter fermentation sizes. So join us. We believe that saving the world is in our genes. Thank you.
helping to help these companies do amazing work uh, and share the results that they were able to share with you today. Uh, I'm just so proud and honored to work alongside these guys. It's, it's really, I mean, it's a dream come true for me and it makes my work just incredibly enjoyable and uh, I'm, I'm truly blessed and honored. Um, thank you all, a round of applause for you guys. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I think it's a, it's a testament to how far all these guys have come in just four months. Uh, you heard many of these guys have just been formed prior to, to the batch starting and even six months ago. This is the fastest moving class we've ever had uh, and I think you kind of you see the results of that. And I want to do just one, uh, bear with me for one second. I want to do something I've never done before which is take a selfie with the team and the audience. So come, team, let's go. <laughs> what? They're, they're all embarrassed about it. <laughs> all right, come on. How do we do this? All right, turn around, turn around, turn around. All right, yep, everybody in? Ah! All right, all right, let's see. All right, thanks, guys. <laughs> all right, so uh, first I'd like to introduce Sean O'Sullivan. Uh, if you don't know, if you haven't heard, which seems impossible. Uh, Sean O'Sullivan is the man behind SOSB uh, and is the, uh, the founder of SOSB, the managing director, uh, which we're a part of. IndieBio is a accelerator, part of SOSB, the, Ac the Accelerator VC. So I'd like to hand the mic over to Sean to say a couple words, and then I'll finish up with a couple uh, house cleaning bits, and we can go out and meet the teams. All right, well thank you. Thank you, general partner of SOSB, Arvind Gupta as well as uh, IndieBio. So, uh, yeah, so I know your brains are about to explode, or they should be, because it's been mind-boggling, uh, what we've just seen. Um, and uh, so I'm not gonna keep you long, but I do wanna sort of say how important it is. Uh, the reason why SOSV invests uh, throughout the 150 companies we invest in every, every year, we're very, very proud of the companies that we invest in through our IndieBio brand. And it's because of the focus and the mission that we have on human and planetary health. If you care about this, uh, we want you to spend some time with these companies, get to know them a little bit, and, and see if they could fit into your investment uh, and profile and your model. I know like, we, we talk about how quickly we operate as a accelerator and that they only had uh, you know, four or maybe six months at the most at the accelerator. The story goes on a lot longer than that for all of these founders. For the last, you know, decades, they've been working on getting, being the best in their class at high school and acing their math and science tests and then going to university, getting their PhDs, getting into industry. This is a long backstory behind, an origin story behind each and every one of these teams. And we are just delighted that we could sort of lift them up on our shoulders for you to be able to see the very, very best life science startups in the world. Every time you come to IndieBio Demo Day, we're glad to, keep, we're glad to curate this, but in order for this to be successful, we need you guys to go out there and see if uh, you, uh, you believe in enough to, to write a check uh, to support these companies uh, on the, the rest of their journey. So um, thank you, and with no further ado, well actually, what was I gonna say? Uh, what came first, the chicken or the egg? And I don't, I, and today, I, I think, you know, the question is, what, what came first, the jaw drop or the wow? I think you've just seen the wow with all of these 11 companies. It's been a, it's astonishing, uh, astonishing and eye-opening and educational experience, I'm sure, for every one of us uh, to learn from these great entrepreneurs that we found. Um, and, uh, and so if you know other great, 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 uh, you know, unique minds that, that would benefit from the IndieBio um, platform and the SOSB investment, please, please, please um, have them apply. We're constantly looking for the world's best teams. Thanks so much, Arvind. So, so, yeah. so we're going to go back out and you guys can meet the teams, enjoy some samples. Investors, please, if you have any question about the technology team or any business model, ask. That's what the teams are there for. They'll clear, they'll clear, clear anything up that you need. Investors, 
These are the companies that are going to be solving the world's biggest problems of today and tomorrow. So take a look and make solid decisions. Um, I'd like you all that aren't investors to please take a step back for a moment and allow the teams to talk to investors first. It's very rare for them to have 400 to 500 investors in the room at the same time. Uh, and so I'll ask that favor of you uh, because they're going to be too polite to. And so you know, after about a half an hour, 45 minutes or so, step forward uh, and, and allow them to, to have that space. So thank you again for attending IndieBio Demo Day number eight. I really look forward to seeing you at number nine. Have a great evening.